This is the Amp Hour Podcast. Recorded August 10th, 2016. Episode 311. An interview with Lewis Rossman. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. I'm Lewis Rossman from Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. G'day, Lewis. Thanks for joining us. Well, I was going to use my usual line, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining me. There is no Chris yeah. Gamble today, which you is took quite the day rare. Off. Yep. You Many decided. will be disappointed. <laughs> I'm the substitute teacher. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, introduce yourself for those who, well, for, probably for the few of our audience who haven't heard of you. I guess. Oh, well, my name is Lewis. I have a store in New York that does, you know, basic electronics repair and just niche hardware. I do a YouTube channel where I show people how to do those repairs. I just talk about business, things like that. Uh, I expected about maybe 30 people to watch and listen. <laughs> and for some ridiculous reason, 190 something thousand watch and listen, which to this day, I will, I will never understand. But <laughs> that's where I am now. So... Yeah, your channel is massively popular now. 194,000 subs. That's one of the biggest engineering channels out there. Um, Which is odd because there's nothing on it that's about engineering. Oh, but it's electronics slash repair. So you're in the kind yeah. of the same space that I am. And Yeah, uh, there's a bit of a distinction know. there because uh, I get comments every now and then going, this per- look at how he did this. He's not a real engineer. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that's the point. Yep. But it's yep. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to go to school to be a therapist. <laughs> I don't know how I wound up here. So, do you have any handle on who your majority audience are? Because I mean, because you do a lot of Apple stuff, so I can imagine you would just be found by random Apple fanboys. Your videos would just pop up, and they might be freaked out by this guy who's repairing Apple products or something. Do you have any inkling of who your like core audience is? Yeah, there's, there's a few different groups. The first are the people who are looking for an answer key, which is cool. There are people that, you know, again, instead of looking at a schematic that's 77 pages for a month or six months to try to figure out what everything does, they look at this and they get an answer key on how to fix their problem and how to make money. So those are like the small repair shop guys that want to stop outsourcing component level repair. Then there's the group of business owners that may not do exactly what I do, but some of the business, ta- business talks and philosophy stuff that I talk right. about applies to them. And then there's the third group of people that I respect. I think it's awesome. I will never understand it. The people that I get all these comments like, this is the Bob Ross of uh, electronics repair. I don't know what he's doing, but I listen to this at night <laughs> to, 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 like, to calm down. Like, I'll put, <laughs> there are people that comment. They say, like, I prepared my dinner. I got my tea. I sat down and I watched you try to solder a wire under a BGA chip <laughs> for two hours. And I... I don't know. I don't. I, 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 I don't know how to fix cars. I don't drive. I, I can't imagine myself watching a car repair for two hours for fun. Right. You know. You're you're gonna have to Bob Ross. Who's that? Sorry, that must be an American thing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's some guy that does this. Uh, he he does painting. He shows you how to paint on TV, and he goes, "Okay, ah. so today we're gonna be putting the brush over here, and we're just gonna be making a little bit of strokes along this." It's one of those things where <laughs> right. you may not know how to paint, but you can. His personality made the show. Painting may not be interesting, but the way he painted made it interesting. And I don't think I have even a quarter of the talent that Bob Ross did. Like. I, I didn't even know who he was until my subscribers brought it up, and I honestly wound up spending 45 minutes watching him paint, and I didn't even know where he started, but it was like, oh, this is, this is relaxing. <laughs> I, you use the key word there, though, personality, because YouTube is personality-driven, and that's why I get like comments from people like, I know nothing about electronics, I don't know what you're talking about, but for some reason... I just like watching your videos and watch you open mail and do and tear down things. But I don't know anything about electronics. And that, like, yeah. <laughs> that just baffles me. But there was the, I don't know. Yeah, there, there was this one guy that made, Eli the computer guy, and he had a yep. bet saying, oh, I bet in I three to that. five years, yeah, I, I, that you're going to be doing content for a living. And yep. the moment that I realized that he may have something to this, there was this, it's not when people like your stuff, it's when people hate your stuff, but they consistently watch it. So I get it. Exactly. I I get if I have an eight-minute video and you reply to something I said in the first 30 seconds and say, you're an idiot for this, that, and the other. Well, whatever. <laughs> but when I have, like, when I, I read a comment and I, and, I cl- and I was just about to, you know, go past it, but then I go, wait a second. 
you, you you hate my stuff and you regularly post, but you commented on something that I said an hour and 37 minutes into the video. So you hate what I do. You hate what I stand it. for. You think I'm an idiot, but you listened. I know you didn't just click on that video and land it an hour and 37 minutes. You watched the whole thing. So when I realized that people can actually, it's kind of yep. like my friend explained, like keeping up with the Kardashians. Like you have all these people that get on Twitter and say, her makeup was terrible. She looked like a slut. This, that, and the other. <laughs> Fuck that woman. But then next week... They're back watching the Kardashians exactly. on TV, and you know I hate to compare myself to the you know the Kardashians <laughs> the and the, Kardashians. That, that kind of stuff on TV, but it it's one of those things where people will actually hate you, but they'll still watch your stuff just because they find something about it interesting. I know yeah. it's weird. I get that. Like I'm like I've had it with you. I'm I'm not watching your videos again. A month later, they're commenting on my videos again. You know, like no, I'm I, unsubscribing. You know. Yeah, like I'll get comments on my channel saying your stuff is going downhill. I used to watch Dave too, and he oh, did the yeah. same thing you do, yep. and his content is going downhill. Yep. And that was a comment I got six months ago. And the really interesting <laughs> thing is I hadn't kept up with a lot of your stuff until that HP rebuild video. But yep. I was reading the HP rebuild video. It's like I recognize these people's names watching the stuff. It was the same person who was complaining six months ago, and it's like <laughs> you hate it, but you watch it. Exactly. Have you ever, know. have you considered that because your channel's kind of like mine in that you have a lot of different target audiences who like it, who subscribe for one reason or another, and they may not like a particular style of video and they subscribe for another type of video that you do, like your business people, uh, for example, who might only want to watch your business related rants and things like that have you thought about splitting the content out to separate channels to try and better satisfy the different audiences or i've thought about it and the thing is there are people that come for the there's the, the business stuff there's the philosophy stuff and then there's the actually fixing stuff and people mm. who, were, who came for the business advice they're like i don't i, I don't care about an rtc circuit like why why yeah. is this on my screen <laughs> and for the most part i just think that they skip and stop exactly. watching it. Yeah, yeah. So the reason that I haven't split it is somebody may have come for board repair, but they have a store, and their store is the same problem with hiring that I'm talking about in the video. Mm -hmm. So now they watch that and they get interested in that, or vice versa. I mean, if I made a different channel for every type of video, yeah, it would be, be just... It's a yeah. nightmare. I, I, honestly, exactly. if it pisses somebody off that much that something appears in their subscription feed that they don't want, you know, the un unsubscribe yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's just... I never understood that they like the from the title and you're it's not like you use titles that are deceptive you know like it's exactly what it is and if you don't like that type of video just don't click on yeah, that like, link. I, just is, wait this, for this, the one you like yeah there's stuff of yours that i watch and there's stuff of yours that i don't watch it's just exactly. i don't like i'm not like, i'm not gonna say oh you you can't do this or you can't do that mm. I, I, it's just i don't know it's weird I'm sure that we could easily turn this into a one-hour therapy session about oh, our comment stream. <laughs> because Let's go. Both... Now, Lewis, what, what are you Which feeling exactly towards your mother? Which is exactly what Chris told me not to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Chris isn't here today to yeah, go yeah, on, so said, we can just yeah. talk about any crap we like. This is good. I think he explicitly said, do not turn this into a YouTube therapy session, which I... <laughs> Right, he did email us, didn't he? And kind yeah. of like tried to lay down the law before we started the yeah. show. And like, <laughs> I think the yeah, I think the most genuinely fun part of doing this and what's kept me doing it for so many years is seeing that there's so much talk right now in in the, the U.S. about like the, the middle class vanishing and that there's no more middle class. Yeah, and we're right. gonna fix it by bringing manufacturing back. Which uh -huh. you know, no, they're not gonna build TVs in in Michigan or Manhattan. Or we're going to bring it back by raising minimum wage. And one of the fun things I noticed with this channel, and I didn't get it until people started messaging me from it, is you have this you you have these devices that nobody knows how to fix supposedly because nobody in our field right. knows how to work on them and i i know that that's not true there are hundreds of thousands of people that know how to work on them they're engineers that got their right. masters or bachelor's degrees then they you know they worked for 3 years at some entry level job and now they want to make 90 to 200,000 dollars a year to be an engineer they don't want to deal with yelling customers or these and 1 to 200 dollar yeah. one off repairs of consumer stuff you know it's just exactly. boring and, so my idea was if I can teach somebody one-fifth of what the engineer knows, will that person be able to do the job for one-fifth of that engineer's salary? So like you, mm -hmm. may, you may not be an engineer. You may just be somebody that flips burgers for six bucks an hour. The person who flips burgers for six bucks an hour, if I can teach him one-fifth of what the engineer knows, can he then make forty or $50,000 a year and actually provide value, like be able to go to a recycling mm. center? Because there was this one guy that messaged me that came as a student. Uh, he used to work at a, at a pizza store as an assistant manager. 
and he watched this stuff for three or five months, and then he st- he he started his own recycling company. He goes nice. to these uh, rec- he goes to, through these buildings, and he will pay them for the right to go through every floor, throw away all their stuff, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the junk, like mm. you know, just this old furniture. And and he will get stuff that like that for for virtually nothing that he can then resell for six or seven hundred bucks. And like this is his nice. way of going from yeah. working at a pizza store to living a middle class life. And that that's that what's really awesome. motivating me now is like there's this that you can actually that. And I'm not saying that you know obviously doing what I do is the the, the solution for everybody, but just this idea that you can like take a skill set and apply it somewhere where they they're not applying it and just find a way to make it work so that. It helps people and it fulfills some type of goal. I That's mean, great. Some I mean, need. and you run classes right out of your shop. You can go take one of your what is it like a week long course or something? Yeah, and the whole idea, yeah, if you have a store and you don't want to stop outsourcing board repair, bring all the stuff that you were about to outsource. I'll show. I'll work with you in real time, and we'll work on it. And we'll work on my queue as well. Hmm. And I, I give people a 140-page sheet of homework to do before they show up, which <laughs> it, it scares people. It's, it's not as bad as most people play it out to be. I've, I include a couple of pictures in it. But I give them 144 <laughs> pages of homework before they show up. And I say, read through this and message me if you have questions. And it's just – and they Ooh. show up with, with, with boards. And you know, m- the whole idea is they should be able to go back and say, okay, we're not going to outsource this to this company for two or 300 bucks. We're going to do it in-house. All uh, right. How many people do you get joining those courses? I would say only a couple a month. It's not like oh, a, right. okay. a lot. Yeah. yeah. I used to do it with somebody else where, where there was about 8 to 12 students at a sitting. Right. And I, stop, I only do it one-on-one now because ultimately if I say, does this make sense? You, c- you can nod if you're within 10 or 12 people and then you, you can get away with not knowing it. But if you're the only one there, I can say, does this make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you can't hide. I, so so, yeah. so if this is so if this component is shorted, will I have twelve volts here or zero? And they go and you're stuck. It's like there's there's yeah, nobody you around have to, you answer. to answer. No, that's right. Yeah. So I can figure out if you know what you're. So though, I, it's yep. not a lot of people because it's one on one. But the whole idea mm. is if you show up and you actually pay attention, that you should be able to go back home and, and do this. So. That's great. Now uh, going back to the Eli the computer guy thing, you may, he he bet you that you would be doing this what full time the content creation full-time within, what, six months or something? Yeah, he said three years, five years oh, just to make it years. safe, but he right. believes three. And you hinted there that you found that he might be right. Is that... Well, the, the, I think that he was right, that there was a yeah. chance of him being right from the moment that, again, I saw that there were people that hated me. Yeah, but, but they, they were watched. They were commenting, <laughs> not on the minute mark, they were commenting at the one hour, one hour. and 37 second yep. mark. Like. Because that, that that's the thing when you have people tuning in who hate you, you you've got I mean there's there's, there's, there's something to that yeah no, yeah and it's, it's like it, it really yeah. wasn't my intention for more than thirty people to watch this like I thought thirty <laughs> other stores in the U S that are tired of outsourcing to L two and Asset Genie are gonna say hey I hate L two and Asset Genie I want to do this myself <laughs> and like the number of people that watch just fundamentally does not fit in with what I. I expected. But. Oh, same here. When I first started this, I thought 50 or 100 people, if I made it to 1,000, that'd be like a successful show and I'd keep on doing it. And, you know, like, I had no idea where all these people came from. It was an absolute shock to me. So so can you see yourself doing, moving over to full-time content and having somebody else do the board repairs and things? I, I know you've got other people working in your shop, don't you? Yeah, moment. I actually found I got I got somebody about a month ago who he took the class a year and a half ago, ah, and he nice. was coming back to New York and he went, and he was looking for a job. So I actually hired an apprentice and Sweet. I, he, he does most he, he does most of the stuff. Like I would say ninety percent of it just as as good as I have, and the other ten percent he'll figure out. It just takes him an extra twenty minutes. But sure, yeah, it, it's it's hard to find people like that. But I mm. I, I, I I could I I can't see myself doing this as full time. I could see myself doing something. And then talking about it on camera, but right. I can't see my, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I would run out of stuff to talk about talking to a camera. Like if I have an annoying business deal with some, uh, n- you know, new partner or I have, I'll mm-hmm. make a business video. Or if there's a board that's being a nightmare, I'll do a board repair video. But without the actual business, there's nothing for me to create content about. It would be true. You know? Yep. Uh, well, you would lose that part of your audience in the core board repair or, or maybe, with your apprentice who's doing all the repairs, maybe you could somehow 
feed his stuff into your videos. Like he's doing all the grunt work actually troubleshooting and you can maybe have more polished content because your uh, content's very real time. It's like if it takes you half an hour to repair a board or an hour, it's half an hour or an hour long content, right? Yeah, I've thought about just a lot of people have said, why don't you fix this? Why don't you work on a drone? Why don't you work on this washing machine board mm. or something? And it's because, I, I mean, if somebody gives me a $40 drone that flies, it's like, I, I can't fix this for a dollar. Yeah, but yeah. If, if, I have, if, the, if YouTube ad revenue actually paid enough that it was a job, then I'd be open to doing all sorts of different content that wouldn't mm -hmm. make sense financially from a retail perspective, but I could do that from a content perspective. Yep. Like, if YouTube gives me... 40 or 30 bucks a day, I can't spend all day fixing, you know, 40-year-old no, right. gear that nobody's going to pay for. But if YouTube made 400 or 600 a day, then I could say, okay, I, you know, who, who, I let, let's fix a Moran's 1060 today or let's work on this drone <laughs> board that I – because I don't care if I fix it or don't fix it. I'm still going to get paid for the video. There's this stuff like that. Mm. Uh, but I think a lot of people have wound up subscribing just because it, I, I hate to say it, just the whole the, the concept of giving the middle finger to Apple. Like there's <laughs> right, literally yeah. an online. There's this one video that I did where the, one of the things that Apple likes to do is they give the software that tells you how to fix the, the machine to the mm. people that are not allowed to actually fix the machine. <laughs> I th this this is the equivalent of giving porn to a eunuch. I, I don't understand <laughs> the logic behind any of this. The software that says, hey sensor vp0r is not working check this one are the people that are not allowed to check the sensor they're allowed to take the entire thing and toss it in the garbage that's but, the and, and, yeah so it actually took me about six weeks and i did it was like the late, late august i did video one mid-october i do video two because it took me that long to actually find the sensor i was looking it, it when when you look at mm -hmm. it it's obvious but you have to look at it at 45 or 90x to even see the damn thing Wow. So at the end of the video, I said, you know, so I gave the middle finger to Apple and that, that literally became a meme. That was on the front page of Imager for like, you know, two weeks. <laughs> nice. I, 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 went out, I went out on a date at the end of June and the person uh, Googled me because they uh, she figured out my last name and the first thing that showed up on Google image search <laughs> is, is, a, is a gif of me giving the finger. And she's like, is this you? And I'm like, no. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, maybe. Oh, kind of that's so. brilliant. That is brilliant. Yes, Apple is. Uh, we could probably spend the rest of the show talking about. Well, do you want to talk about it now? This yeah, uh, huge thing where you were getting sued by Apple, and it went viral. It hit well, the, I learned tell a couple us a of things story. about that. But I got a call from their law firm, and their law firm said, "You know, we want to speak about this, that, and the other," and they didn't sound very happy about it. Mm. And I immediately hired an attorney. It's like, <laughs> right. I, I've had enough legal issues with other companies and I know better than to just start talking on a recorded line uh -huh. from an attorney. No. Um, <laughs> in my, in my, I hired an attorney. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. The reason that I thought that was not going to go very well, I have a friend who, you, you know, have you ever, do you, what type of phone do you use out of curiosity? Oh, I got a uh, Sony Android thing. Yeah. Sony so you know, Xperia. Yeah. Right, so I, I, don't, I don't use iPhones either, but the iPhone yep. 4 has a back glass that you can slide off. You take off these two proprietary screws and it slides right off. It's a worthless piece of the phone. It's worth, this thing has got to cost a cent to manufacture. And it has a little Apple logo. And it breaks all the time because Apple's one of the only companies that's actually going to make the back of their phone out of a crackable glass. <laughs> right. I, could, I could throw my Motorola 3G out the window. It may have a dented corner and a cracked screen, but the back is not going to crack. Right. On the iPhone, and that this was a business, and you know, 2010 to 12, there were hundreds of thousands of people buying the glass, you know, this little wow. back glass okay. for a few yeah. bucks online, and and selling it to their customers for ten, you know, saying we'll replace the cracked glass on the back of your phone for ten to twenty bucks, hmm. and and it worked because Apple wouldn't replace the back of your phone. They, 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 at the time, they just weren't doing that, so you you it, it was ridiculous. It's like this thing literally slides in. There's no flex wow. cables, screws, installation. Easy. And my my friend was doing this, and he had and the thing is, it had the Apple logo on it. His store got raided by Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. <laughs> I mean, I, I get like the oh, law, yeah. but like immigration, like people with, he was a Marine, so like, he wasn't too scared by it, but like people with guns and full bodies, That's, whatever, yeah. like they, they showed up at his store. Wow. And, uh, you know, and they've done this to a couple of other companies. There was a lot of it in 2013. So, and these people did not receive contact from an attorney. So I get contacted by an attorney and it's like, Oh shit! Yeah, and and then and, and the, so far I still haven't I, I actually haven't heard back from uh, from after my my first week of contact with them. So my attorney said that they said, oh yeah, there's some content in one of your videos, 
and we would just like that that, that 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 not be there. And they're obviously referring to the fact that there is a schematic in the video. Right. And okay. Now, I, I have a couple of issues with this. But they didn't say uh, that? They didn't say s- schematic specifically? It was all... Uh, they said... Uh, I can actually find it on Skype if I scroll, because I, no. I don't want to wind up saying something that's not true. No, so no, I'll, that's I'll a... let me find this. But, yeah, they, they, and it's obvious that it's the schematic, because when you look at the, at the seconds in the video that they're complaining about, that's oh, where okay. the schematic gets right. shown. Uh, but and they say you know we you know we just want you to remove that part and as you know if you get a certain amount of views in a YouTube video you can't edit it you can't so yeah, I can't, exactly so I would have to delete it and th- I have I have a couple of issues with that the first is that uh, uh, the, the here we go they said the they want me to remove the video showing portions of Apple's confidential schematics that's right. what the, that that, that okay. was their wording so the the, the issues I have are a uh, I would have to remove the entire video. Which I don't want to do. I can't mm-hmm. even edit it. I lose the that, that video has a million, uh, yeah. million views. People wow. are clicking that from all over. Even if I were to re-upload the video, anybody who clicks on that, who has sent it or emailed it or whatever, they mm-hmm. click it. They're just they're not, they're not going to find what uh, the video. The second thing is that I have two hundred or two to three hundred videos at this point with the same thing. So <laughs> right. you're yes. saying that Avalanche. you don't like that this one video yep. has it. So yeah. I get rid of that. Okay, but what's going to happen tomorrow when you come knocking mm-hmm. for another one? And another one, and another one. Like, are you okay with these other videos having it? Yeah. I have no idea. So I sent the, you know, I, I had my attorney send them the very polite version of, you know, if you'd like this content removed and you don't agree with me showing people that where a fuse is located, and that's something mm-hmm. that I want to get into with the fuse later. If you don't want me showing people where a fuse is, that's, you know, you can file a DMCA claim like everybody right. else. Exactly. Because um, the thing is, I spoke with, a few people that, uh, and I, it was actually somebody for Good Morning America that wanted to do, that wanted to have somebody on the show and talk about this. And the reason that this is not discussed is that every time one of these large companies does something like this, they don't mm. want to get the negative press, but they also don't want to test the waters with whether or not what they're doing is right or wrong. Oh, yes. So they will, they won't send a cease and desist in writing. They won't say something in writing. They will call you. They will say things that make you want to delete it. So uh-huh. they can walk away from it and say, hey. We never sent the cease nope. and desist. This guy decided to delete his own stuff. Yep. And because of that, there's no story. So I'm thinking if, I, if anything happens as a result of this, it'll be drawing a line in the sand, which is ultimately... Uh, now, the schematic I showed, I understand that there are trade secrets. I understand that trade secrets exist. I don't believe that a fuse is a trade secret. No, what I show not. in the schematic <laughs> is... I'll show you. There's a 3.3 volt power line that shows up when the machine is in S4 state. S4 means that it's hibernating or anything above. So hibernate, sleep, or on. So you have 3.3 volts with this in an S4 state. You have a zero ohm resistor, which for all intents and purposes here, it's like 132nd a watt. It's a fuse. Yeah. And then you have a connector for the trackpad and the keyboard. So this is a fuse that sits between the 3.3 volt power line and the keyboard and trackpad so that if you spill something, which is very, if you spill anything on your trackpad sure. instead of the machine dying, the fuse blows. That is not a trade secret. That is like, laughable. Like I mean, I'm sure, and you know, maybe 1650. This was some. This was trade secret. But like, are you? I mean, the, the stuff that we're calling trade. Like that's the thing people say that this is trade secret and confidential. It's like it's just embarrassing how little some people know. Yep. When they say that, it's like in 1965, if you wanted to say that the SM bus communication used to allow a laptop to read the battery percentage off of the battery mm-hmm. was fine, make the argument. But like. It's 2016. Acer is not going to say, oh, my God, we couldn't have a machine that could charge a battery. But now that this guy put the schematic on YouTube, I can rip it off from Apple. It's, it's like it's not you, you can't call this proprietary or exactly. trade secret information in a 2016 society. Yep. So great. Uh, so I sent back a letter saying that and I haven't heard back since. Now we have a couple of uh, ideas as to what's going on behind door number one. They figured out, oh. We actually like this guy. We're sorry that we did this. My bad. <laughs> Behind door number two, they are de- um, going through filing a claim on every single video I've uh, ever done. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's really one or the other, and I, I have to wait to figure it out. My receptionist has joked and said maybe they'll wait until after Trump <laughs> becomes president and everybody loses their mind and is pulling <laughs> their hand out about that. And they don't even notice that they took down all of your stuff, which is actually... That's what I would do. I mean, I would right. wait until after the election and everybody's <laughs> incredibly mad. <laughs> That's you know, or, that, that's. Uh, what about the option <clears throat> that you simply called their? Well, you didn't. You actually called their bluff, and yeah, and and they don't want the negative pub- publicity from it. Yeah. So there are some attorneys I spoke to that said I don't think that a schematic 
This is a machine. This is a drawing made by a machine. So they said a drawing made by a machine generated drawing is not copyrightable. And, oh, I, and I'm paraphrasing a conversation of a month ago, so right. I could be getting some things wrong. But they said, I don't think a machine drawing of this is copyrightable. And further, it's a drawing, it's a diagram that illustrates what you've been given. So everything that's in that schematic, granted, mm -hmm. practically speaking, I don't want to go through every single point in a board with a multimeter and make my own diagram. But you that could. Sounds, I, I could if I had an absolutely nothing better to do and, you know, yeah. I had a multimeter and I was willing to draw for, you know, a year or two straight, I could make a diagram. It's just I don't, I don't want to, but I could. So mm -hmm. that is a drawing of what I've already been sold. I've been sold the, the, the computer. I can open it with my screwdriver and then measure everything. How can you call that a secret or confidential when you've already sold it to me? Exactly. All this is, it's, is an, it's, in a, it's a drawn form of what was already sold to me. I under, you know, if, if, if this was source code to the operating system, this would be a mm -hmm. different discussion. But this, I'm not asking for source code to the operating system. I'm simply sharing a quarter of one page of a 76-page document that represents what you've given me. Yep. And like, are we really at this point in society where me showing a consumer where a fuse is on a product that breaks all the time is mm -hmm. something that actually has to be taken to court? Because the, the re I saw this as, as a terrible thing at first, but now I'm seeing it as a good thing because the video they chose, it's not how the RTC circuit makes PM Sleep S4L show up. It's not some you know re crazy current sensing circuit so that the backlight doesn't blow when you spill water. <laughs> it's a fuse. Exactly. It is the it's the most fundamental building block of any electronics. So like they yeah. chose the best video to actually make this an issue. Cause, I mean, From a point of view of losing. Any yeah, cool case that it, comes up, yeah. If I cannot convince the general public that a fuse is not a trade secret, oh, then, then I, I then I yeah. failed as a content <laughs> creator, an electronics professional, a salesman, and a human being. Like, and, and I totally. I need yep. to be. I, I should be able to make that case that the, if you look at this, that you you cannot rebuild. And if I was giving away information that allowed somebody to literally just you know plug and play into a three D printer, recreate the entire machine in five seconds, I'd get it. But that's mm -hmm. that's, that's not you know. No. It's showing yeah. a redrawn schematic with a fuse. Now, yeah, you're in where do where do like you can buy schematics to Apple products right on the black market? Where do they get them from? Are they official Apple schematics that leaked out, or are they I would guess redrawn they or what? I don't think it's. Re I think well, the, I think there's some PDF redrawing or some machine redrawing because some of these drawings just suck. Like you'll right. see, huh? Where is the enable signal coming from? Or where is this one wire coming from? And then you'll see on the other side of the screen there'll just be a box that keeps <laughs> looping. And I'll go, okay, maybe the box that keeps looping goes to this, and it will. So, but but the, for the most part, the fact that they keep in all the logos, including the Apple logos and, and dates, tell me that it came from Apple. But right. I, it's like if you Google eight two zero twenty nine fifteen schematic right now. You will find mul multiple websites where they are mm -hmm. selling that for five dollars. Like there right. are tons of. So I understand. Even if they wanted to be mad that the schematic exists, I understand that they're mad. I, I don't think that they should. But if they want to be mad, I get that they're that's, mad. That's fine. Take yeah. it out on the guy who stole it from your company exactly. and then resold it to every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the internet for five bucks. Yep. A thirteen-year-old with his parents' PayPal information can buy these schematics. For five dollars, like I, mm. I paid a hundred or two hundred bucks at one time to buy this entire zip file that came with everything, and I, and and that's how I got it. It's like it, it take. So the other argument to be made here that one of the attorneys mentioned to me is that since they have done zero takedown notices on any of these websites that have been just at the top of Google for over four years, right? You're not. This is not a secret. You're not protecting the secret. It's like interesting. So what? Uh, what is going to happen from this point? Do you think nothing? Is that the most likely scenario? They'll well, just I'm give up? I'm strongly leaning towards like them waiting for Trump or Hillary to get elected, everybody to lose their shit because they hate these <laughs> presidential candidates, and then five days later my channel goes away. And nobody cares because they're too busy bitching that Trump right. became president or something. That, that, again, that, that, from a... From a from a media, or I guess a PR point of view, I, if I were working at Apple, I would do nothing. I would let it all die down and mm -hmm. let people think that I overreacted to everything they said on the phone. And then after the presidential election, I would just hit, you know, delete. I, I would <laughs> I would take all those twelve hundred claims I filed at once yep. and just and just submit them to YouTube and have channel go away. That, that, that's. But the other thing that could happen is they could simply not care. 
Uh, right? They could of not. Of course. I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's the most likely scenario. Yeah, and, but I, I've never seen. Uh, here's the, my attorney said that it was silly of me. One of them because I, I went through a few before I found the one that I want to use. Now, one of them said they are not prepared for. You know, they came to you nice. This is a company mm-hmm. that never calls you. That is never like they're not courteous. Like, like, like with my friend, they're the type of people where again, ICE is going to show up at your store before you hear a word from them. They're right. not the type of company to to, to not send a cease to call you before they send a cease and desist. And so they said that you know you should. You you should probably uh, take that as you know just delete the video like to just do the smart thing and delete it. <laughs> I took it as okay maybe they're doing that because they don't have a case because they yeah, don't want exactly yeah and I, there was I, one attorney I think so I think that's yeah. most likely yeah and there was one attorney that told me yeah we've, we've done cases like this where companies will actually put uh, you know they'll have a human draw things into their schematics and documents just like little artistic mm. figures so that they can actually copyright it because they can say it's a creative Bam. work so yes if you've ever exactly. seen i don't know if you've seen any of these schematics for really new stuff where they have the like what what, what the hell is a cartoon drawing of a human doing in here <laughs> they do that because that enforces the copyright because the machine did not draw that that's a creative work now on the entire page, even though you're just like it's all computer generated, but you do a little stick figure down the bottom, and bingo, yeah, like it, it's suddenly no, copyright. It, it's like some of these. I forget the name of it. I gotta, I gotta message him and find this because it, it, it's cooler now that I'm actually talking about it. But this, it, they have this, this schematic, and then there's like a you know, like the great A under A YouTube videos. It's like just hmm. you know the this uh, entertainment comedy channel with the stick figures. There's drawings. It's stuff like that, more professional, but like that. Yep. In the actual diagram, like here's the buck converter, here's the silly crap, and the silly crap is there so that they can say, oh, copyright, this is not a machine-generated document, a person did this, this is a creative work, and mm-hmm. no, no, it's not. You put a fucking stick <laughs> exactly. figure in there. But it, yeah, the one thing that I've visited doing is if let's say they say that I can't have that, uh, can I redraw the schematic myself yes. using my own, my own, like, because there are people that have said, look, you can redraw it using this program and just get rid of their logo. And, and, and whether or not using the schematic online is legal or not legal, that's, that's an argument. But if I literally just take their, their, their schematic and like draw it in red and delete the Apple logo, a judge will, or a jury could see that as a wise ass action. Totally. Whereas if I just draw it myself, in my own way, with my own, with hands, or well, I've been mm. doing in videos now. Microsoft Paint. Yeah, I've Paint. seen that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing it to try to demonstrate how silly it is that you know that, that this is a copyrightable work. But if I do that, then maybe I, I, then maybe it's fine. The only thing is that this would, I have like 300 videos that are between 40 minutes to an hour too long. That that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you, you, it's something you can't do. Why do you think Apple have such a problem with? guys like you actually repairing products and and showing them showing the how to repair products in the beginning i i thought it was one of two things either a they want more money off of uh, their own repairs and off of people buying new ones or b that they did not want people fixing them improperly and giving it to them so they have a flat rate system like again for for a certain machine 750 flat rate to figure out what's wrong with it or 1250 if it's a higher end one to figure out what's wrong with it 1250 bucks it, this is this is accidental by the way wow. I, I just want to be uh, there are certain machines where for 280 they'll fix everything wrong with it if it's not accidental right. 90% of it is accidental and it's easy to accidentally damage the I'm not you know whether you like the operating system or not is subjective but the fact that these are very easy in terms of liquid and even moisture alone. Mm. It's easier to kill these than it is a Lenovo. That's just objective fact. You can pour a gallon of water into a Lenovo. It comes out a drain hole and goes around taping the board. <laughs> right. you, you, you get you get nail polish remover from like you know from from your manicure in this, and it just it just eats everything. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, what was I just talking about? Ah, the. Yeah, so I thought maybe they just wanted, they were tired of people sending it back to them after repair attempts. Because if they get something with a blown backlight fuse and mm-hmm. they charge the customer $750, they can just turn that board around to somebody else. If they get something that somebody who doesn't know what they're doing tries to fix it and destroy it, they gave the customer a new board for $750, but they can't reuse the old one. But what I'm starting right. to think as time goes on is that they're getting more and more people trolling them in China and just blatantly knocking off their stuff that they want to make somebody an example for intellectual property, trademark, and copyright, mm-hmm. and trade secrets. They, they, they just want to make somebody an example because they're getting owned so they're getting owned so badly in China. It's, it's, it's insane when it comes to this stuff. Like, there are people just blatantly ripping off yeah. many aspects <laughs> of what they're doing. And I've talked about this in other videos. Like, for example, the, the entire supply chain that, they have, that, that most of small independents have, 
it's sad that it's come to this, but it's just because we are not allowed. I can't go to LG or Samsung and go, I want to buy a thousand of the screen for a hundred thousand dollars. Please mm. give it to me and I'll wire you the money. There'll be a plant. I heard this from one of the, the vice president of sales at Intersil five or six years ago. He said, somebody is probably, they probably have to make 15,000 machines today and they get 15,500 screens. Somebody in middle management says, eh, we got 15,000 screens today. Yeah. And then that, those 500, 500 wind up. Go magically disappear, door. and yep. that goes to a vendor that then sells it to us. I, I, I mean, those are that, that's where almost every single screen that you see these products on eBay came from, in one, okay. one way or another, because you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but I but, get but that they don't they like genuine that. ones and fake ones on eBay. Well, if, when it comes to uh, to laptops, there's no fake. There's just right. genuine stuff that didn't make the cut because a machine made a mistake. And stuff that genuinely should not have made the cut because it's just garbage. <laughs> right. So usually we're getting stuff in the middle, which is stuff that didn't make the cut because the machine had a, had a conniption that day. And these are all perfectly fine, but the machine said that it's not. So okay. uh, it, it's, uh, there's stuff like that. I, I haven't been to Taipei to see all of this for myself. It's just what I hear from people who know more than me. But I, I understand why they would want to crack down on that. And but. So I think that like I could be a really good example of this because I have a video on YouTube showing how to fix these products, mm -hmm. showing the schematic, talking about their practices with a million views. You know, it, it brings attention to it, and I think this would be a great like little whack-a-mole to make an example <laughs> out of other people. Right. I don't know. It's yeah, an opportunity but... to be a, you know be the mole or or, or win. <laughs> you know, uh, I would like to not be the mole. <laughs> you want to be the hammer? Well, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah that no. Well, no. You don't want to be the hammer. I don't want to be either. Don't I just want to want hammer to be the tech sitting else. in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tell us about the right to repair bill that you've been fighting for in Congress and other places. The entire idea is that what I do should not be cool. I mean, people here like I have to log into these secret servers and pay somebody, uh, you know, deposit money in their bank account. And after I do that, this is before I could just PayPal schematics, I could deposit money in a bank account. Hmm. And after that, I can get a schematic. Or I have to PayPal somebody at this strange email, 300 bucks. And then afterwards, he'll email me at the email I put in the comments to where I can get schematics. Wow. And I have to, <laughs> I have to find parts from these vendors that got them out of a back of a wig. It, it, it sounds like some kind of strange, shady drug deal. And the idea is that this is a nerdy industry of people that should like, I just want to come to work, click, and just buy a schematic with my credit card and just have yeah. it show up. From, I just wanna, From the manufacturer, official. I, I want to send Samsung or LG or one of Samsung or LG's brokers a purchase order and just know that the parts are going to show up and that I'm not, like, wiring money to a scam artist because yeah. that does happen. There's times where I've just wired 2000 bucks away and I just pissed away the money. Uh, I, I want for, This should just be a basic industry like every other industry. Like, mm. I want to buy a part to do my job. I buy it. I want a manual. I buy it. I'm willing to pay. I would pay three times as much to buy the manual legitimately than I would yep. through these ridiculous means. I'm, I'm okay with it. But the issue is the option doesn't exist. So the doesn't whole exist. idea yep. is – and the bill is very, very vague. This is something that manufacturers shouldn't even it, – it uses the word fair uh, so many times or fair and – I uh -huh. think it was the word fair or equitable. Yep. And again, what, what is fair? Like no, they it could has determine, to be determined by a court of law. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they could argue for what is fair. It's not like I'm saying I want parts – for 10 years at the cost that it costs you to provide them. Like, no, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to sell me a part to a 2007 machine for a dollar. I expect that a device that, came, uh, that I can program an SMC for a device that came out six months ago. Like, reasonable, mm -hmm. fair and reasonable is a big part of the bill. We want the ability to have parts, manuals, so that we can do these basic things to make things work again so that I, I don't have to either choose to you know, find a schematic on a shady website or spend five years of my life, mm. you know, going, measuring a board to find out where the keyboard fuses. Why do you think this just hasn't automatically happened in the past? Why aren't manufacturers doing this? Is it the manufacturers going, no, we don't want our products repaired or no, we couldn't be bothered or, you know, what? I, I thought that would be a good differentiator these days, you know? I don't. I mean, I don't mean this in an insulting way. I don't think I'm old enough to understand the culture, the, the culture shift. Like people who grew up mm. and were doing this in the 50s through the 80s, yep. back in the age when manufacturers would give you this on the back of the TV. I, you I, I you got a schematic in the back yeah. of a TV. That's the, the schematic thing, like, I would, would be pasted in the back. I wasn't born in that era. <laughs> I, I didn't grow up in that era, so I don't understand how that culture managed to shift. I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in this culture. Now, the only reason mm. I'm familiar with the old culture is because I started. 
working in, in, in recording studio environments or broadcast studio environments. And even though that was in 2007, 8, 9, and 6, the, I w well, the gear that was being used was like a Neve 8088 from 1975 <laughs> yeah. or 76 was still being used. An SSL J9000 from 97 was being used. A Poltec equalizer from 1951 was still there. So they still had, even though that mentality had and that culture of repair had been dying, it was still there. So mm. I, I rec I, I don't know what changed. I think, I mean, most of those devices were devices where you buy it and it, you, you pay a high upfront cost and it's supposed to just always work. Yep. I think a lot of these new devices, uh, it's just, a part of it is it's simply... It's the culture. It's the throwaway culture, you think? I think a part of it is throwaway culture. And I think a second part of it is admittedly, somebody goes to a third party place, the third party place ruins it, they go to the first party service center, the first party service center is now screwed more than they would have right. been. Right. So uh, they got jack of it. You think the manufacturers might have got jack of all these cowboys fixing stuff and go, ah, oh, it's just not worth it. Why bother? Yeah. And I mean, and also it probably doesn't contribute to their bottom line at all to release this information. I mean, just mm. the system. Oh, no, no, I certainly wouldn't. Yeah. For me to request the information, I have to request it from somebody. Then mm. I have to pay somebody. Then you have to determine whether or not I'm somebody who should receive it. Like, that's a big question with, the, with this uh, bill. Should... It be everybody who receives the information, or should it be only certified stores? Should right. it be? Uh, does it have to be certified stores, or can it be anybody that has a business license? So, like, I have a I have a um, appliance and home electronics repair business license, but I'm not Apple certified. Should I be allowed to get it because I have a license and I'm not Apple certified? There's a big thing to do about who should be able to get it. It creates bureaucracy mm -hmm. and yep. it create and it creates trouble for the manufacturer. But at the same time. There's a lot of good it should do. For, it can do for the world. A device that is able to capture and edit 4K video in real time should not be sitting in a landfill because of a dead resistor. Like that's just, exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. And there's that's the thing. There's more of those devices, even just in this stupid little niche industry. I'm sure there's so many other industries that are just like mine that I haven't met. But just in this little industry, there's so much stuff sitting out there that if I retired from having an open shop to the public and I just took in all these devices, I'd be busy for 30 years. Like I'm. You need why, people to go through and fix this stuff. Why Why hasn't some big manufacturer caught on that this could be a differentiator against their competitors and like have a logo on it, like a repairable logo and like the schematics are on our website and go for it, you know? Like why – I I, I, like I can't believe that, that market forces haven't – sort of you know are they not smart enough to do that or like i mean it, it probably creates a bit it, it's going to create a little bit of a mess for them let's say somebody tries to fix something that would have been out of right. warranty yeah. because they dropped it or spilled something on it and they try to fix it while it's still in warranty mm -hmm. they botch it fixing it in warranty they try to pretend that they never tried to fix it and bring it to the store right i yeah. mean I, it, it creates a pain in the ass for them but at the end of the mm. day that 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 sh you can create policies to deal with that i've exactly. created policies I have a store in the East Village of Manhattan. I mean, I deal like I deal with a very high concentration of eccentric and eclectic <laughs> nut jobs that come into the store every day. Like, there are ways to deal with these things, and there are, you you can create policies so that it makes sense for you. Totally, um, you can just put them out there with uh, the world's biggest disclaimer that says, you know, if you yeah. send this to some non-authorized repairer, then it, it like don't send it back to us ever. Yeah. You know, and it's well, like it's. And it's a really growing field in things like data recovery. So with your phone, you probably have an SD card slot. Your idea of data yeah. recovery is like, pop, <laughs> I have my card. With, with iPhones and iPads, the data is all you know, so on the, the chips they, that are soldered yeah, yeah. onto the board. And they're matched to the CPU and encrypted. So, I mean, that, 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 you, right. you, you can't they're even take the chip. Encrypted. And I understand from a privacy point of view, that, that, oh, that, that's a great yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to, I can't just desolder. Like, I could desolder the chip from an older Android phone, the EMMC. Put it into a little, you know, into something, reader. and then I could just yep. put it in an SD card reader. You can't do that with the iPhone. So if somebody, um, let's say it gets dropped in a toilet or the ocean, or even this has happened, people have gone running, and the sweat from them running, having wow. a phone in their pocket for music, that will actually wind up destroying the phone. I destroyed a BlackBerry 8330 that way. I went running. I didn't notice how disgusting I was when I went running. <laughs> I took the phone out of my pocket. It was drenched in sweat. It never turned on again. It rebooted. So this, this is, and the thing is, Apple offers repair services at high prices, but when it comes to data, they offer nothing. If you wow. have a phone, if you have a, an iPhone 6 with a shorted yep. CE5202, which is a common one right by the Wi-Fi chip, it's on the mm -hmm. corner. If that capacitor is shorted and you give uh, Tim Cook a million dollars and say, get my data, he will not remove that capacitor so that the phone can boot without Wi-Fi. 
Like mm. there's there's literally there. It's not even like third party repair when it comes to data recovery. You don't have options. I mean, I'm you know unless you're on the most is wanted the list cloud? in the FBI. Is <laughs> right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The Boston Marathon phone. Yeah. But, the, the, like the, that. That's kind. Of, isn't the cloud supposed to solve that problem? It is. And the, and and but that's the and users are users and they never use it. And like I mean, there are a lot of people that do use it, but all the pe- again, if, but the people who do who uh, do use it are probably not the people that are coming to me willing to spend two to four hundred dollars right. to get their stuff. Pe- users are careless. People are always going to yeah. be careless, and the person making fun of the person who is careless <laughs> is the person that tomorrow is going to do something really stupid. I, I don't even. I, I try to just stop making fun of user carelessness. There's there's doing something st- like idiotic where you yeah. know you're breaking something and you don't care, but then there's just carelessness and and there most of the people that show up they thought that it was working and only half of their stuff got uploaded or they have like you know or the entire thing wasn't backed up it Mm -hmm. happens so i mean the the cloud is a great thing but for something for a mistake like that shouldn't there be an option so that even if somebody wanted to pay thirty thousand dollars somebody could get access to a manual and do this it's just silly that there is no option in the modern world totally it's just nuts what like so what's happening with this repair bill is it uh, last year it didn't go through. This year it didn't go through. Actually, last year it got. A, uh, there were a lot of people in favor of it, and it right. didn't go through. We we all visited last year, and one of the reasons that I I that it, it at least had a chance last year is because we got to we got to debunk a lot of the, the BS. So there were mm. we got to talk to a lot of assembly people, senators, assembly people's aides, and my my favorite one of all of this, and it's just the one that like I think is one of the few things that will actually raise my blood pressure when I discuss it is where they were talking about how. Well, oh, the lobbyist said that when you use a schematic to run a wire, you've then turned it into a into not an Apple computer. It's now a PC, but and oh. you don't re- you you don't tell your customer that you turned it into a PC. So by releasing schematics, we're helping you misrepresent Apple products to consumers, oh. and that this is consumer protection what? because we're not we're not going to allow you to rip off the consumer. And I mean, it took oh. no more than ninety seconds of me explaining why this is the most ridiculous horseshit oh. in the world. And it took all, it, it took like all 26 years of patience and, uh, you know, <laughs> skills to not just expl- explode and blow up inside yeah. the Senate chamber. Cause I, I mean, that is, that, that is such bullshit. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, the shit that they, come, like the shit that these people come up with. And I don't know if it's the fact that the politician is out of touch with technology. So they misinterpret what the lobbyist said or the lobbyist actually said that. I don't know. Like, cause again, it's like hmm. a game of telephone, but the fact that somebody in that building actually thought that and there was nobody there to correct them wow. is a big part yep. of the problem. All the people who, there are so many people who talk about how government should be and how law should be mm-hmm. and how the world should be. Amongst their friends at a coffee shop, at a bar, at a you know, at a Yankees game, but, but they don't actually visit to talk about it. And that's one thing I learned is that if I want change, they they, they listen. There was one of these aides that that's actually good. decided I am go. I didn't have breakfast today. It's about three thirty in the afternoon. I have a fifteen minute break. I could either get breakfast. I'm hungry, or listen to you. And they chose to. And he chose to listen to us. He didn't eat that awesome. day. They do. The thing is, everybody thinks you know the politicians don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't care. Okay, maybe the presidential candidate will say whatever they need to get elected. Maybe they <laughs> don't care about you. But these, like again, the, the local politicians, they'll yep. listen to you. The, the, this guy, I could tell, he was hungry. He didn't eat his meal. He didn't go out to his planned lunch and breakfast. <laughs> he stayed there to listen to us talk about this bill. They so, will. They will often form policy based around just a couple of people talking to them. The the, the squeakiest wheel gets the oil. Yeah, so again, if I'm not. If if you say a ridiculous argument and I'm not there to rebu- refute the ridiculous argument, mm. then like the ridiculous argument doesn't sound like – because you could say almost anything and have it sound like uh, – you, you can have it sound sensible if you explain it in a certain way. Absolutely. But you know, like, I mean you could say that a capacitor is called a capacitor because it's based on a bottle cap because that's <laughs> the way it looks. And if I'm not there to show you what a capacitor actually looks like or to explain any of this – that sounds great. Like you, sounds- you need somebody. <laughs> you need somebody else to be there to present a counter argument. And yeah. I understand if they're dealing with policy issues on immigration, on the economy, on on you know like um, civil rights or any other type of issue that's at their office, or you know budget. Do I give budget to um, the e- education or to the police department? And we're here arguing over fuses. Like if there's mm. not somebody that shows up to present a counter argument, then they're going to listen to the argument in front of them. And I, I, I went from being somebody in my early 20s who's like, screw the politicians, they don't care, to when yeah. I visited realizing, I understand why they don't care. 
are we when was the last time a repair shop owner decided I'm going to close my store today? I'm not going to make money. I'm going to take a train ride mm. so I can talk to these people. Yep. Nobody does it. Exactly. And I feel like this yeah, this year I feel like it didn't go through because we weren't asked up. I sh- I think we should we should have just went up and uh, talked to lobbyists on our own. Mm-hmm. And tried to to you know get in back into the Senate chamber again this year. I think we should have done that, but we didn't because we were never asked, and we're busy with our own businesses running and you know running like chickens without a head. So <laughs> right. we didn't do it. And uh, Xerox, Apple, IBM, and another company, I think Cisco, but I don't want to say that without checking my email. But I know is Apple, IBM, and Xerox all showed up, and they presented their counter arguments against the right to repair bill. And, wow. And our arguments were. Not there because we weren't. Yeah, yeah. So who are you, who are you going to listen to? No, the smartest exactly. of Apple, IBM, and Cisco, or a non-existent argument. Like if you can't even show up to present your argument, why yep. should we listen to you? Is probably what they're thinking. <laughs> half and the reality of, half of half of winning is just turning up. Yeah, and I I didn't do. I didn't even have a tie on last year. I didn't have a, a, a script. <laughs> what I I did is I showed up with a motherboard that was dead that I ran a wire on. Uh, you know, to the time on pin of a buck converter I see. I just ran a, I ran one wire and I showed them this is a $750 product. When I remove this wire, it becomes worth a $20 product. This wire hmm. is worth a cent. So this, it, it takes something out of the landfill. And also, yep. rather than this going back to China for it to be refurbished by whoever for, you know, $2 an hour, somebody in America can charge anywhere between the one cent the wire costs and the 750 Apple cost. Hmm. It, creates, it creates a job in America. You don't need a certification to do this. You don't need a, ne- a college degree to do this. It creates you know, just a turnkey job for anybody who has common sense who can you know, spend uh, the, the time required to figure out some of this basic stuff. And uh, it also it fixes the e-waste problem. You can say that, you're, you, yeah. that you, you, you care about the environment now. It creates a job. It take, makes something work again. It's a compelling argument. It's, like, it's a completely it's like, compelling argument. Yeah, it, it takes 90 seconds to explain this to somebody. Yeah. And when they see that I plug it in and the light turns on and the fan spins when I put the wire, they're like, they're like okay, like, you don't have to explain anymore. We're done. And well, you know, we're on board with it. It's just mm. you have to show up to make the argument. And, and will this, like, if it ever gets passed, will it be like a national federal law or will state-based laws, I don't know how the U.S. works, like... This one was a state-based one for right, New York. It, was. Okay. it would still have to get passed for other states. I would like this to be a federal one. I would like this to be something that covers. Mm, ideally, it yeah, would be yeah. something that covers you know everybody. But I don't I don't know enough about international law to know even how do you, how do you do that. I don't even I don't know to be honest. I don't know a lot about. I, I'm I'm not a lawyer in America. I don't know ex- the entire right. process. But anything is better than nothing. And of this course. would have been a step yeah, forward. Yep. It would have set some precedent. And it's something that's going to be applied to a lot more than this. Like right now, I'm talking about whatever disposable consumer electronics and cell phones and data. Mm-hmm. But you know, th- this can apply to like ha- where else is technology going to go over the next forty or fifty years? And how much mm-hmm. you know, this it's going to apply to a lot more stuff. You know, this this can apply to drones. Like we don't know what drones are going to be used for now. We don't know what most technology is going to be used for right yeah. now. I went to uh, this this show this. Um, Hope this hacking convention. Uh, it was an absolutely amazing thing. You had designers, engineers, hackers, programmers come from all around the world to share ideas, not judge. They mm-hmm. had this huge space in the Pennsylvania Hotel. Nice. If I knew if I knew about it before, I would have went to every single event. I learned about a lot of a lot of things they were doing there. There's a bed that exists that will tell if your significant other is having sex. What type of sex she's having based what? on the based on <laughs> based on responses it gets from sensors inside the bed? It, it, it sends it to you, including where she is in the bed, what where the impact is, the speed and the intensity of it over Wi-Fi. Like two years ago, nobody would have thought of this, but there's going to be it's silly, but there's going to be so many areas where technology takes control over our life, and if we back down <laughs> here on something as stupid as a laptop and a cell phone, like where are yep. we going to be when it comes to your car, you know, your, yeah, your drone, course. your time machine, whatever the hell it is that's going to be the new thing in 2050. Mm. Why aren't you an Apple authorized repairer? Because it sucks. I mean, it there's sucks. nothing that I can right. do. If you, if you come to me and you say, I spilled a drop of water on my machine, yeah. I have to tell you that's 12, that 150 bucks. Oh, so and you, you're gonna- you, you've got to charge the Apple rate. Yeah, as an Apple right. authorized, I'm not allowed to fix motherboards. I can get the tool. But once I have the tool, if all I had to do to get all this stuff was pass a test, 
I wouldn't even be bitching right now. Like if yeah. all I had to do to get a schematic was like they, they, I, they have me show up. They go, okay, solder this. Okay, what do you do if this, this problem exists? Hmm. I would go through that test. I would go through the bureaucracy and I'd, say, and, and I'd be fine. But if I go through all of that bureaucracy, I take all those tests, I have to do everything their way. If a single key on your keyboard doesn't work and a liquid sensor got tripped, that's 750 or 1250 depending on the model. I can't just replace your keyboard. Wow. I understand why they do this. They don't want to French they, they don't want to have a system whereby you have 100 or 300 retail stores in the United States and they have these, you know, the people making 10 and 12 bucks an hour doing diagnosis on all this and customers coming back saying, "I just paid you 300 bucks mm. and now this doesn't work." Because yep. liquid damage is like cancer. I mean, it, it hides everywhere. It's hard to ab find ab it all. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you don't want to have a $10 an hour worker rooting that out. But it doesn't, work, it doesn't work for me. I can't tell a customer, I know you paid 1200 bucks for this, but you have to pay me 800 to replace mm. what is essentially a keyboard. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how I would stay in business. And the second reason I don't do that, I'm not sure exactly what Apple's policy is right now, but a lot of major manufacturers require that you sell a certain amount of their product per quarter or per oh. month to keep your certification. So wow. let, for, and this is what happened to me with Lenovo. So let's say that I have to sell uh, $60,000 a quarter, and that's a very conservative number. Let's say I have to sell $60,000 a quarter of, of, of Lenovo laptops to be an authorized repair center, and you come in and there's something wrong with yours. What is my inclination going to be? Is it going to be to sell you something from the window, or is it going to be to fix yours with yeah, an huh? option? Yep. Like, if my only option I can offer you is seven fifty, and I have a financial incentive to sell you the laptop in the window, Bingo. I'm not a repair store. Yep. No, Whereas, that's right. As a repair store, I have a financial incentive to sell you the resistor for two or three hundred bucks because yep. that's profitable. And also, I don't have that incentive to sell you what's in my window because you know, the stuff in my window is just the stuff that people never picked up after a year. If it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, somebody else will buy it. So I feel right. like being an authorized repair center, the way that the policies are written up, is fundamentally incompatible with actual repair. If you want to be in retail, become an authorized repair center. If you want to fix stuff, it's awful. But yep. What is the hardest part about modern repair? Because you, you know, uh, rip off huge BGAs like they're nothing. And, you know, that, that, that sort of thing scares the crap out of me, quite frankly. Like modern stuff, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a bit old school repair. Yeah, you know? my, and it's I, like, I, 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 I know it's possible, but there's got, you know, this looks like there's so much trial and error behind learning these sorts of skills. Well, I, I remember one of my best tech mentors that worked alongside at Avatar Studios. He was really good at this. He had over 30 years experience. He was an electronics engineer and what good, well educated good experience and he told me this is all dead because smds make things unfixable and, I th <laughs> right. and and this guy is still to this day much smarter than me if he put even a quarter of the time i did in, he would have done 10 times better but he i still remember hearing that from somebody in their mm. 50s that was experienced and i look back on him saying that and i think to myself like there was yeah, isn't that isn't that cute? There was a time that you actually believed <laughs> yeah. it. That was right. Uh, everything is scary when, when you haven't done it, and it was exactly. Uh, yeah. The, so the soldering part. Yeah, I mean, there were. T I bought a uh, Hacko FR801 many years ago, and I mm. decided I'm going to replace this one chip because I think it's what's bad. I didn't know what it did because I don't have a damn schematic. I, I don't know what right. this does, but it's blue, and I know it's supposed to be black and not blue. <laughs> so I'm going to take it off and put a new one on. And half of the stuff around it just not knocked off and I damn near wanted to cry because it, it went from being semi-working to totally dead. <laughs> and that happened over and over and over. And it's this trial and error process because mm -hmm. like right now there's a lot of – even outside of my content, there are people doing content on how to f do these small BGAs and other nightmares. Right. In yeah. 2007, 8, 9, like I remember Googling how to replace a QFN package. There was a class that you took for like maybe two thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. bucks, which it's you know like I'm it's you know I'm, I'm eighteen years old. Fuck that. And then there's also the uh, there's also there was a guy that had a PC board that had a bunch of traces that were literally like these V's in the board that you could actually dig a pen into that you could fill with flux and solder and then just bring it all the way to the chip with no components. And I'm just looking at this mm. like what the this is this this is like showing me how to swim with swimmies. I mean this is in a, in, in a pool like that that's that's not how to be an Olympic swimmer uh, that's going to race this, this is this is not real and it was incredibly frustrating so it was just a lot of trial and error until it made sense mm -hmm. a lot of it is becoming comfortable with a microscope because once you can actually yep. see what you're doing it's not scary oh totally yeah because like if i'm looking at something from this for example if i tilt the board up at an angle i can see how it solders to the, i can see the actual balls themselves under the chip i know if i did something right or wrong 
it's easier than before when I was just because I could see it with my eyes, but I'm still half blind if I'm looking at something that's like zero two zero one. Oh, crazy! Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so a lot of it, the soldering part, you can overcome with experience and just mm-hmm. watching somebody else do it, finding techniques that work for you. But the part that really sucks for me and the part that I hate the most is the complete lack of of uh, having somebody to call me an idiot. Like a lot of people will say, you think that you're a genius. Uh, because of this, that, and the other. And I think the opposite. I think I, I, I know exactly who I am. I'm a college dropout that uh, cheated on his chemistry regions to get through high school that couldn't pass pre-calculus. I want, to, I want to be able to talk to somebody just like in the studio business, have them say, you're doing this all wrong. Why the fuck did you miss this? Uh, this is how the circuit works. And the reality is there isn't any of that. I have to look at it and I have to guess what happens and in what order. I have to guess, yep. does this chip know inherently from firmware to create this voltage or is there SM bus communication that's going to do it because there's no data sheet for the chip. That's, that's mm-hmm. also proprietary. There, there's no data sheet for how the chip works. I have, everything has to be a guess. So the, but the part that sucks is, fig, like again, you, you'll know how a basic buck converter or a basic transistor work, obviously, but yeah. how everything goes together a, what signals have to be present for this signal to be present? Mm. That's a very frustrating question because there's, there's nobody out there who's going to say, oh, you're being an idiot. You missed that. You need th- a signal A before you get signal mm-hmm. D. And I'll, you, you, you really just have to guess. And that's just staying up until 5 in the morning uh, for 5 or 10 hours on end. So just guessing and, and uh, finally finding a board where it's like, oh, this thing doesn't work because it's smoked. And when this thing is smoked, before I fix it, I'm going to measure every single signal that is and is not present so I can see how this relates to that. Yep. And that, there's a lot of time and research that goes into it. So right now I do a video where I, I, I look like I know what I'm doing. Do because right. I, because in, in 15 minutes, I'm like, well, PM Sleep S4L is missing. And that's because SysClock 32K is going above 1.7 volts, which means it's shocking the PCH. It's easy to say that. After you spent the 16 hours figuring exactly. out that there's a relation yep. between RTC and PM Sleep S4L, you don't do you, see the 12 hours of work that went into that. So that, that's the part that sucks. No information. Do you think that people might get the impression that it's, it really is as easy as you make it look sometimes to do? And, and there's, well, there's good, that can be a good thing and a bad thing too, because they can yeah. go in and. Yeah, you know, well, goof it up. It's good that they'll have a go and they'll learn stuff, but then I guess there could be a downside as well. Yeah, I get people who call me like, "I'm not giving you three hundred bucks to fix my fifteen hundred dollar <laughs> thing. I'm right. you, to, to do this, and I'll go okay." Hey, and what go I do it. a lot of the time is, yeah. I won't even just say go for it. I'll say, "There's nobody using the second desk today. My assistant is off. You can sit down. Here's a spare board with parts on it. If you make it work, it's free." Right. I have not met a single person. In the years that I've had the current retail store that I have that's taken me up on that challenge and actually won. Wow. They wind okay. up sitting there just damn near one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they, they haven't put the hours in. They yeah, haven't got like, the experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like I watch dancing on ice and I think, oh, I can do that. And then I you know, <laughs> I try to rollerblade and it's oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, so there there what what I'll tell people is listen, I respect that you want to do it. All I'm gonna ask you to do is A, watch my entire video. Don't watch mm-hmm. One minute. Because I the thing that I've tried to do to make these videos accessible is I try to explain every single point. Like when I'm yep. saying this is a buck converter, I don't just say this is a buck converter because I know I'm gonna lose a lot of the audience there that doesn't mm. that you know again not to be insulting, but the people that, that let's no, say no, flip burgers or work retail that are aspiring to do this. If I say this is a buck converter, so obviously I expect this here. When I say that I lose I know that I was part of the audience that was getting lost there. I know I've lost ninety mm-hmm. percent of my audience. So I explain every single thing every single step of the way. I've explained what the one wire circuit does at least 90 times because I just don't have it in me to say, go <laughs> back to this video yeah, and yeah. watch it. I'll, I'll say right. that and then I'll go, screw it. Let me just explain what this does. So I, so I say, watch the entire video, the entire thing, if it's 40 minutes or, and then do it. And the second thing I'll say is try on something cheap. Open up Absolutely. a flip phone. Open up a $50 Acer. Don't open up your phone that has your baby pictures on it that's dead before practicing on a flip phone don't open up your three thousand dollar machine that belongs to your boss that he uses for live video recording of concerts before opening up a piece mm-hmm. of shit fifty dollar <laughs> acer so i mean I, I try to i i don't try to make it look easy i try to give you the impression that it's doable the whole idea right. is and yes. sometimes i dumb it down more than i the whole i the I, I want people to see is if this idiot can do it then so can i i want people to actually get confidence from seeing that's mm. that i'm able to do it 
and make it look simple. So I don't want them to think it's easy. I want them to think it's achievable, I guess, if that makes any sense. That makes complete sense. No, yeah. that's great. One of the best, <laughs> the funniest things I saw is when um, you took uh, Linus from Linus Tech Tips um, to task over him using a toaster oven to reflow a BGA and thinking that he's, uh, you know, permanently fixed it, which of course, you know, is not true. Yeah, and that- then he came to your shop and then. <laughs> And then you guys were too busy chin wagging. You were going to, I'm going to show him how to do it properly. And you guys were too busy chin wagging that you left it in the oven too long. Yeah, that, 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 that entire was... thing didn't go the way. <laughs> the, that was hilarious. For, first thing that, that was, I, the entire reason that I don't like reflowing is not because of people fixing their own stuff or trying to make it temporarily work. I don't like yeah. it because from 2006, you familiar with the HP DV9000 and that entire series of shit machines? I've, I think I've heard you mention it. I'm not familiar with it because yeah. I'm not in that game. Um, I mean, like, the, there was an entire several years where pretty much every single laptop release just had, w- would last for a year or so and have a dead video chip. And right. with a lot of repair shops, you had a lot of these people that didn't do any type of repair that literally started businesses around taking a butane torch to the motherboard wow. and burning the chip. And yeah. it would work again for, uh, for 50 days. Yeah. The warranty <laughs> was 30 days. And, well, this led to a lot of pissed off consumers, a lot of ripped off consumers, mm. a lot of chargebacks, and ultimately people not trusting repair in general. Right. So people, the thing is, a lot of people in the comments said, oh, nobody can possibly take this seriously as a repair thing to do. And it's like, I wish you were a part of this community. <laughs> <laughs> Watch. <laughs> I have people showing up to classes saying, oh, yeah, I put this in a reflow. And I'm like, oh. It's like they'll heat a tantalum capacitor. Instead of yeah. figuring out that a tantalum capacitor, when heated again, will work, well, they'll yeah. put it in an oven, give it back to the customer, you know, two-week warranty, a month later it's dead. <laughs> so people thought I was irritated at the regular individual fixing their own stuff. I, I don't care. I don't even fix graphics cards. I, but I, don't li- I know that people are going to watch that and they're going to do that. Mm-hmm. And when I was visiting the Senate, they were giving these excuses like, oh, yeah, people are doing this, that, and the other that they shouldn't do. This is why we can't allow third-party repair people to have... This is why we can't give them nice things kind of thing. Wow. So when I see that like the, one of the largest tech channels is like, look, I'm going to put a GPU in an oven, like I, I, I just lost my shit. <laughs> and, the, the, the gut. And, then, uh, and then he actually contacted me, and he was very yep. nice about it. And he said, you know, would you want to do some type of video together on it? And I said, sure. If, if there's any way to, re- to bring about awareness for the whole right to Absolutely. repair thing, I'll do it. yeah. So he, so he visit. I think is I don't, I don't use that machine to do that anymore because I bought that machine for the 2011 MacBook Pro. They recalled right. it in 2015. So I don't even have, I, I didn't have anything to work on besides this one board that had just been thrown at a wall that was fucked. So <laughs> I decided to take the chip off that and reattach a new one. It doesn't work for uh, many obvious reasons, because mm. uh, I, but also the way that it was done, like I would explain. He would ask a question on how to use the machine. I, he would then turn the camera on and explain it. He would ask a question about the next step, turn it on and explain it. Yep. And like the, when I actually watched the video, it's like, huh, yeah, I'm just kind of like standing there staring at the camera. I, I look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> and the thing is like, I, I don't think, he's not a, he's, he's, a, he's a really nice guy. Like meeting yeah. him, I'm not just, because there are a lot of people that I don't like. I could actually get along with him and talk to him. We, we had dinner and it was, it, it was a fun evening. We talked about like the, the silly moderators at DFI Street, the OCZ uh, scandal with money. Just a lot of, you know, YouTube troll stuff. We, we, there was a lot yeah. to talk about. He, he was a really nice guy. But, so I know that he didn't mean, like, it wasn't like I'm going to purposely edit it to make him look like a jackass. But it's like, mm. yeah, I did a really good job of looking like a fucking idiot on camera. <laughs> like, oh my God, I did a good job of looking like an idiot on camera. Like, but it better was than fun usual. though. Yeah, it was it was honestly fun, and the fun yeah. part, the most fun, is soldering the chip on. We were bitching about television, so he was he was passionate <laughs> about technology. He was saying, you know, you'll have this six thousand dollar TV that has a crappier processor in it than this fifty dollar Android f- blue phone. <laughs> yeah. So that when you're on the when you're switching channels, it'll take ten seconds to switch the channel. Why is that? And while we're in the middle of bitching about six thousand dollar TVs <laughs> that have shit interfaces, it's like. That profile is supposed to go for 290 seconds. We're at like 400. Uh, oh, my. Even if the board had a chance of working, it was never going to work after that. Like, if you even zoom in on the chip, it's like it's a different color than the CPU <laughs> at that point. It was up. Uh, oh, that's I had, it like, was a pe- single shot deal, too. Yeah, and it's like, I, it's not like I have other stuff to do it on. Because I, I have vi- BGA videos where everything went well. That's, that is, it, yep. It's like, I have video, I say this, when you actually put up a camera, nothing will work. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, but well, the lesson I learned from that is the way that you present this, something will, mm. like, if I want to highlight repair shops should not rip people off by putting stuff in ovens, and I mm. present what I present in the asshole manner that I did, it's going to come off as this jackass is mad that I'm fixing my own graphics card instead <laughs> of sending it to him. So, yep. it, like, my, my, I know that my core, my core audience understands uh, what I was saying, like the core thousand people that watch, but what I learned is when I'm speaking to an audience of 40,000 or 60,000 or 100,000 people, mm. that you have to be more careful with how everything is interpreted. So that was a good yep. lesson for me and how to not be an asshole. Um, I'm still going to be an <laughs> asshole to some extent, but that was, like, that was just unproductively being an asshole. Like, Don, for example, like with Donald Trump being president, like he has to realize that when he says, I'm sure the Second Amendment people can do something about it, he has to understand mm-hmm. that when he's talking to 280 million people, that a lot of those people, even if 0.1% of them thinks you mean, oh, the Second Amendment people are going to shoot Hillary, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, that they are <laughs> going to think that that is what Trump meant. Um, yep. Because and it's something that, it was a lesson that I learned from that entire experience. When you're talking to a larger audience, you have to phrase yourself better and, you know, Mm-hmm. Not be as not not be as much of an asshole. <laughs> what have you got any recommendations for tools for SMD repair and rework? That, yeah, I mean, uh, the, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go. The first is is a real hot air station. Um, mm-hmm. I you know uh, I would I've tried a lot of the cheap stuff like the 858D and the IUE and the UU right yep, yep. I have never the ones you can get for 50 bucks on eBay yeah. yeah and the thing is that this and I always wondered like how are these actually working for people are these all show reviews and then I started reading forums and a lot of people are saying they work so then I started hitting view all posts and I see mm. what they're working on they're working on single layer dual layer <laughs> PC exactly boards exactly not well, yeah, like eight the thing layer of, motherboards yeah yeah and the thing is a- after 2009 apple started this, it, you can just feel that it's a different material it doesn't feel as glossy it's a, I, I don't know enough i don't know anything about pcb design again I'm, that that's not mm. my thing i don't i don't know anything about it but i do know that when i i look at it and you feel it it's made of a different material and those pc the old pc boards absorbed a lot of heat see apple does machines are, are almost mm-hmm. kind of made to like cook themselves from the inside out rather yep. than have Real ventilation, dare the computer be a quarter of an well, inch thicker. Well, they hold but, a lot of heat because they've got the ground planes. They'll have several layers of ground and power planes yeah. in there, and copper but, retains that heat. Yeah. Like after well. 2009, the heat sinking and the, just the, the way that those boards absorb and dissipate heat was insane. Mm. And then again, after around 2012, thir- after 2013, I noticed the material looked a little bit different again. I, you can't remove a keyboard connector with even the Hacko FR801, that was a $650 wow, station really? that I loved, I couldn't get that connector off. So what I do is I heat the bottom of the board, because if you heat the plastic from yeah, the top, yeah. it'll just burn. Yep, yeah, I course. couldn't get it off at that thing after the half hour. I had to use the JBC. That's like an $1,800 hot air yeah. station. So, the fir- so if you're working on any of this, th- what makes it a lot easier is buying a real hot air station. Like, right. Um, well, what, what, you know, a good friend of mine, Jessa, at iPad Rehab, she was almost at the point of tears as a figure of speech, you know, just, and then at one point, literally at the point of tears, she actually wound up sending me a picture of her with a tear coming down her eye with a board that she was holding up as, uh, cause it was like four in the morning and she couldn't get an led driver soldered. She was using a crappy station and I offered to express mail her mine if she would express mail it back after she soldered the chip just so that she could realize no, s- that there's a difference. Yeah. And she bought one, and she's like, oh, because she thought it was her. That's the thing. People think it's them. It's the, they don't, right. I don't yeah, want to yeah, say yeah. that the tool is going to no, make no. you good, but if you give me an 858D, I'm probably not going to fix anything with it. It's no, just it doesn't have experience. the thermal capacity. It just, yeah, so, it's just not there. Yeah, so good SMD rework is just having yeah. a good – if you have something with a bent nozzle so you can see under the microscope, because I like the, the, if you, the JVC because mm. it has this bent 4-millimeter nozzle. Uh, that that's helpful having the four millimeter nozzle versus like six or eight or ten. Right. Those just th- there's no real air pressure when you go below four. No heat comes out of it. So a four to four and a half millimeter mm. nozzle on a good hot air station makes everything a lot easier. Especially if you're working with a product yep. that has ten layers heat sinking inside of it. Uh, uh, a good set of tweezers. I like those Hacko uh, CHP three SA CHP three SA because they're. V- they're very, very fine. It makes picking everything up very easy since they're very fine. Yep. Uh, a good, mi- you don't need a really expe- you don't need a mantis microscope. You can buy, oh, no, a, no. you know, like a three hundred dollar amp scope. Will, yep. w- it will do wonders for seeing everything. Uh, you know, good flux. There's a, I, I, do my you recommend on- an optical scope, not a not a digital? 
I think I don't know if because it's a of preference the lag thing. and everything else. Yep. No, I, I have I used my I tried to use mine as a digital because it's HDMI. It's sixty frames a second. Yep. It's ten eighty p. It has it has no discernible lag and it's very high resolution. Mm-hmm. My something happened with my focus block one day where I it, it wouldn't I couldn't get it to focus on the screen and in the oculars in real time and I wanted to do a video so I thought I'm going to do the video by just looking at the screen and it was it, it, there was no lag it was a great picture and I tried for an hour and I couldn't get anything done I don't know if it's a lack of depth perception if it's getting it's used a dev, to a 2D it's presentation a th- yeah I think it's a 3D depth perception thing I I couldn't yeah. do it I I tried for an hour mm-hmm. and it was torture. And so I don't recommend the digital ones just because from my personal experience, and this can be different for other people, I can't look at a 2D monitor and get any work done. I have no idea where my hands are going. Uh I don't don't know like if I'm going to crash into the board or if I'm moving the right direction. It's a nightmare. I... It's a very small additional amount of money to spend three. I would rather have a really cheap uh, traditional microscope like the Mm -hmm. Amscope SE400, which is like 160 bucks or somewhere around there, than have a digital one. uh, Right. Because I I don't know what I'm doing. I can't. can't, Yep. Yep. It's painful. Fair call. And soldering irons? I like the Hacko stuff because it's 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 really cheap, it's reliable. The interface on all of them sucks, but I don't care. I just set a temperature <laughs> yeah, right. and I keep it there. <laughs> yep. So uh, I I like the Hacko one just because I, I like it turns on instantly. You have a great a great tip selection, by the way, is important important for me. So I like tips that are multi purpose. I like having a tip that let's say has a really large elbow, so that if I need a high thermal mass, it's there, but yep. then has a really fine point. I like the knife tips so that if I want to use it as a fine point, I can. But then if I turn it around, I mm-hmm. get the entire Bam. blade. Yep. So I, I don't like conical tips. I, every, oh, they're all soldering, awesome. yeah. so, soldering irons have always come by default with conical <laughs> yeah, tips. I know. It's insane. I, don't, I think that's just to discourage you from fixing stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you're supposed I, – I don't know how people plan, get worked yeah. on. Like I watch these <laughs> IPC certification videos where people are doing stuff with it. And God bless them. They're much better at this than me. God bless them for their skill set. I don't have it. So like having a good, I like a, I like a curvy tip mm-hmm. or I like, where I can do drag soldering. I like having a really fine tips that also have a large elbow so that I can switch back and forth between fine tip and high thermal mass. That makes things easy. A good hot air station makes things easy. I've had a lot of people show up that went to, let's say, Wild PCS or one of those places where they have this $50 Baku IUE piece of shit. And they say, <laughs> yeah. like, so they say, honestly, you know, I'm not, I'm not as good as a professional yet, but like I thought I was worthless and it, it really is the stuff. Like this yeah, makes everything. Totally. It, makes ev- it makes it easier when stuff just works. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying that Weller is bad. I have a Weller hot air station that's great. I've tried Weller stations that are great. Um, it's mm-hmm. just I just use Hacko because I started with it first and... Sure, and it works, and they are a professional brand, and they get the job done. They make anywhere from simple stuff up to really yeah. high end stuff. Like, so, I, yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's not. I, I'm a cheapskate, so if I could buy a sixty dollar <laughs> hot air station and it would work, you wouldn't see me using any of this. I'm just using yep. this because I've, I've tried the sixty dollar one, and the chip just doesn't come off the board. Like mm. I remember spending ten minutes with that eight fifty eight at full temperature, and I just pointed it at myself just to make yep. sure. It's like, oh, yeah, it burns my finger. It's definitely hot, but it's just. They, they 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 don't work for these things, and it gets mm. even worse when it comes to cell phones because you're dealing with these really smaller areas. So you need like perfect accuracy because yep. like you're heating a chip, but right next to it is a chip with underfill. So if you exactly. heat the chip next to it, the all the solder the, those that's an entirely new nightmare. Like you're you're trying to solder one BGA with 96 uh-huh. volts, and next to it. <laughs> is another BGA that has underfill. So if the underfill gets hot, it squeezes the balls and all the solder balls shoot out from under the chip oh. and you're screwed. It's like oh. you have... So, I mean, this is where you're doing stuff like Captain Tape and you, you can use a penny as a heat sink. Oh, I've used a penny as a heat sink before. Okay, nice. So you put a... You know, you put a penny yeah, yeah. on the, uh, let's say you're trying to replace the U2 chip on an iPhone 5. Yeah. It's a charging chip that's right next to the CPU. You put a, a penny on the CPU, a piece of captain tape, and then like another, a nickel. Nice. And that absorbs the heat yep. so that it, it does, so that the CPU doesn't get it. There's all, this is all stuff that you're going to figure out, but you're going to figure it out after <laughs> yeah, like the 10 way. times of popping CPU <laughs> balls out under the CPU. Oh. It's just, a lot of it is just experimenting and just being totally okay with the fact that you're going to fail miserably mm. on something. And just hoping that that <laughs> thing that you failed on is something that was cheap. Hot air rework is almost an experimental, like a a suck it and see kind of art, unless you've done that particular chip on that particular board before and you know the thermal properties 
of the board and the chip and everything else because you've got nozzle width, you've got airflow, you've got temperature. People think you just set a temperature and that's fine, right? But the width, as you, I think, mentioned, alluded to a few minutes ago, the width of your tip changes the airflow, which then changes the amount of heat flow, etc. Yeah. So it's, if you're it's, using... If you use it like a, a two and a half or three millimeter nozzle and you have it at the highest heat you can, mm. it's not going to do it. Whereas four millimeter, you can have it at a much lower heat and it'll work. The other thing is the heat in general. People say, what temperature do you use? I don't, mm. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I don't even, like at some point my Hacko FR801, the knob broke off. So I didn't even know where I was on the knob. <laughs> right. And it didn't, it didn't matter. Like I know, I'm, am I hot enough? Okay. So like, yep. for example, I, I got this little digital, this fluke, uh, it was a fluke, um, Temperature probe. Oh, and yeah. when I set yep. my when I set my weller to uh when I set my weller to five hundred thirty seven Celsius, I get four ninety out of it. When I set my <laughs> JBC to four hundred fifty Celsius, I get five fifty out of it. Mm-hmm. Like the, I don't I don't I mean this is and the Weller and JBC, this is not IUE. This is well known expensive yeah, brands. Yeah. And it's that like I, I just don't and I get different numbers almost every day that I use them when I try calibrating it. I just don't care about the number. I just set it right. to where I, you know, I work on something that is dead. Mm-hmm. So where I'm not going to be screwing anything up, I figure out what temperatures work and at what areas, and you know I figure out when sometimes any, if I need more heat, I just bring it closer. If I want less heat, I mm-hmm. take it further away. Like I control the heat with my hands and yawing the station. Rather, I, I do a, more yawing from le- like than, than I do moving, but I control it with my hands rather than with setting the temperature. But the, the number that the, the station reads is literally worthless to me. It, it like you can say 350. I'm not going to get the same result until unless I use 500. And you would have to be in the same room to figure out why that's even the case. Got it. Fifty percent of the time is that your station is, even if it's the same model as mine, is putting out a totally different number than um, <laughs> than minus. <laughs> because it's yeah, it's a combination of not only the temperature of the element, but the airflow, the size. Uh, because you've got not only the temperature setting, but the airflow setting as well. The size of your nozzle, the angle you've got it at. The surrounding components, the uh, the heat sinking of the PCB, and it's just there's so many factors that go into it. It's crazy. Yeah, it's something that you just have to get used to. And uh, that's because the the most common question is what temperature do you use for this? And like, yeah, yeah. And I, I'll, I'll right. just send them a picture of the front of my of my FR801 that doesn't even have the knob on knob. it anymore. It's like <laughs> what no, I usually I go hotter than necessary because I yeah. can always it. Because I can, you can always take the heat. If you just have a thermocouple and you put it on the board and you move the nozzle a quarter of an inch away from the board, oh, yeah. you'll see a 30-degree drop. You, you control the temperature with your hand. You don't control exactly. it with the – you think yep. you control it with the number on the scope. But unless you have a thermocouple on the chip, like when you're doing large mm-hmm. – if you're replacing uh, like you know a 900-ball large BGA, you need to do that. When you're replacing small stuff, you know like a 28-pin QFN or a, yep. you know, a, a 90-ball BGA – you're not doing any of that. It's not practical. Like you're controlling it with mm. your hands and how far it is from the board. Do you think, is there such a thing or do you think, it just occurred to me, what if you had a thermal camera looking at the board? So instead of looking at it visually, well, maybe a combination of visually and a thermal camera pointed at the chip, would that be helpful to know, oh, look, I, I know this thing's going to melt at 300. You know, it would be genuinely it's going to be able to 250. If you could make that show up in the microscope, and that's yeah. where technology would be. Yep. What I said before, I don't know where technology is going. If you could make that thermal show up in the actual microscope mm-hmm. ocular so that I could see it while I'm working, that would be yep. amazing. I would love something like that because I, I do something like that right now with flux. So what I do is I put <laughs> too much flux on the board, which yeah. is a, there's which a nice you get a lot of complaints blogger. over, by oh, the way. Oh, man. I, I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of nice stuff, and there was a lot of, like, this, you know, uh, interesting, other interesting stuff there. I, I personally don't give a fuck. I mean, it's like you're <laughs> not doing what I'm doing anyway, so it's exactly. irrelevant. But, so what I do is if I add too much, I know the temperature at which it's going to burn away. So if I have mm-hmm. a puddle around, let's say I have an SMC chip with 96 balls. There'll be a puddle around the chip, and then the puddle will slowly start to shrink to where the mm. puddle is maybe a quarter of an inch outside each side of the chip, and then yep. the rippling part of the puddle will be an eighth of an inch, then the rippling part of the puddle will be one sixteenth of an inch. And I can actually tell what the temperature of the chip is based uh-huh. on where the flux puddle is rippling. And you'll see that That's the a outer visual part indicator, of it, yeah. Yeah, the, the outer part of it has gone away. So if you take that away from me, 
then I don't know the temperature of what I'm doing. So I have a profile for myself. I preheat the board from far mm-hmm. away. Then I get a little closer. Then I get a little closer. Then I know when I can go in for my last 15 seconds where I'm going to first see the chip drop, wait five seconds, and then I'm going to yaw the eye, not move it, but yaw it back and forth yeah. so that I can see the chip dance. This is all something that you just got to like figure – this is mm. all something that you got to learn and you're going to learn it through burning some screwed up boards beforehand. But once you get – it would be nice to have you know the temperature show up on the board via colors in the microscope. But th- this is – I use Flux to do that and you know it's, it's a – I'm sure I'd save in the long term if I used uh, a, a more appropriate technology to do that. With heat, it really just comes down to trial and error and learning what works for you. Like for me, the little system of having flux around the chip and then knowing when the flux is at a certain point that the chip is a certain temperature works for me. It's it's just a feel thing. It's like the number that you see on the station really doesn't matter. If you t- if I tell the station to be 500 Celsius, the board could be 100, 200, 300, mm-hmm. 500. It depends on how far away is my hot air from the board. Like that. You could set whatever number you want on there, but are you just going to take out a tape measure and measure your distance yeah. from the board? Like, nobody does that. That's why it's just pointless to think about a lot, a lot of that. Just get a really, really powerful, good station that has a good set of nozzles. Mm-hmm. I like bent four millimeter nozzle and five millimeter nozzles, and and you'll be set. If you find hot air rework and SMD rework sucks, I mean, I, I know that I know that like the cost of entry is is kind of high on some of this. I when I first spent six hundred fifty bucks in the FR eight hundred one. That was a month, like mm. that was a month of my apartment rent when I bought that. Wow! And I was broke, yep. so like that was like that was, that was like legitimately betting on my future just to buy that. But yeah. I, I had an Hako 851, which was cheaper. I bought it used for like a hundred bucks, and like nothing would come off off of the board. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> so are they are they like you know thousand pin BGAs that just will not come off unless you put a preheater on the bottom of the board and then your hot air on the top. Yeah, gun on the top. If, if you want to replace a CPU or a graphics chip or a large chip, mm-hmm. you need a professional machine like that other one that I have, which I yep. never use to do that. Oh, okay. I don't right. use that machine because I can, I can only buy those chips from illegitimate sources. So there's, <laughs> and, and those sources usually sell junk. And that, that's also a big to do. It's like, it's not a, uh, okay, let me replace this chip in a few minutes. It's let me replace this chip yep. in 40 minutes. If I spend 40 minutes replacing a chip and either the chip is bad or the board is bad for some other reason, and it doesn't work. That 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 that's not economical for for me. So I don't I don't use that. But if you want to replace like a thousand ball chip, you're, you're doing that by hand is just. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody could make an Olympic sport of it, but it's not a good idea, <laughs> right. especially for a hobbyist. But like uh, you know, yeah. a, a ninety ball or a, a BGA with like point twenty five millimeter balls that that's doable. You can do that with hand rework stuff like the you know the Hacko or the Weller or the JBCs. You know. I personally find I don't do like much rework stuff. You know, I do so little of it that it's like I like I lose the skill almost. Like if I, you know, if I haven't uh, like used my hot air gun for like three or six months to actually, you know, remove a chip or, or do something, it's like I, I almost have to practice again before I go in there and do it. Yeah, it's um, it's you know. t- it's totally blue collar work. It's not. Like there's engineering and there's figuring things out. That that that's arts and crafts. I mean, when I when I like have to take three wires in one recent video, I had two or three wires going underneath a 25 pin BGA that's a quarter the size of my pinky finger now. <laughs> yeah. There's there's no brain being used. I mean, that that's all that's all arts and crafts, and that's something that just like any sport is just gonna, you know, if, if I decide to stop running, I'm it's I'm gonna find it harder to run a mile a year from now than today. Yep. So it's just. It's just something that you have to to keep at. And if I don't do it for two weeks and I come back, it's like, wait, was I actually doing this? Like, holy, how did I? Yeah. <laughs> two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks and, and you can lose the feel for it? Yeah, like because there, there are times where I'll, let's say, take a few days off and my assistant will do yeah. board repairs while I do something else and a student will come in and I'll go, and he'll be screwing something up and I'll go, no, this is, how, watch, I'm going to show you a tactic and then I want you to try this tactic. It's like, wait. This isn't working for me. Fuck. <laughs> because uh, like, it's humans. Oh, wow. Humans were not like. I mean, maybe surgeons were meant to do this, but like we were not meant to take three forty-two or forty-six gauge wires and shove them under a micro of twenty-five no. pin micro BGA. It's not natural. And like tuck them into little craters in the board, and like I'll. And there are things you can do. Like I'll make a little. If I want the wire to not make the chip go up, I'll actually dig a crater in the board if the pad is missing. So I'll dig a little crater. I'll shove the wire into the crater, and then I'll use and then I'll <coughs> use that. There's if there's a if the component is missing and the probe point is missing, you can scratch mm. until you get a nub. 
You can put flux there. I'll take a 0.25 millimeter solder ball that I actually buy. You buy, you can buy bins of wow. 0.25 millimeter, and I'll put it on top of the nub with flux, and I'll use hot air, and then I'll make my own. Like, because you can either spend an hour with a, screwing around with a pad repair kit on something that you can barely see, or I, yeah. can, or I can. This is all stuff that you figure out from just looking around your desk and going, okay, I have to make this work. What do I have around me? Oh, I have solder balls that are left over. <laughs> let me try pouring this ball on the board with some flux and heating it, and it winds up attaching to the board nub, and I'm like, let me try that again. And then I actually wound up making a pad out of solder balls attached to a nub. Wow. It's like, you, you, <laughs> all of this is art, it's arts and That's crafts. That's nuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to also, someone who doesn't do repair every day, it's like, that's just nuts. You know, like, wow. I, mean, but I can understand why you, why, why you do it. I have the knowledge to understand, you know, the, the, the reasoning behind it. Um, but yeah, I can't <laughs> still help but think, wow, you know. I mean, when I see people figure people out, like, uh, just this is the type of power supply I want. This is the type of board that it is. Because the board is this long, I need to put this component in this section. To me, that's wizardry. And, you know, it's all, the, right. when you don't, when you don't, when you're not, don't hmm. do it or you're not yep. used to it, it seems like, it all seems like magic <laughs> until it's not. <laughs> Got it. Lewis, thank you very much for joining us. It's been interesting. Thanks for letting me yabber into a microphone for almost two hours. No, well, not quite two hours, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, the la- last people... question, actually, before you... Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So you filmed your knee surgery. Did you... Were you is that something you were planning to do anyway, or was that something you did just after a, a, a trolling YouTube comments joked about it? No, I, I was hoping that the uh, surgeon would um, be able to record it for me. I, I knew I wouldn't ever get permission to, you know, bring my own camera and gear in and stuff like that and set up and you know so that just wasn't going to happen but uh yeah i asked him and he said yep you know we'll I, do think, it and, I think that's amazing yeah. my, my dad had the same type similar surgery and he had yep. the camera up and you know like i don't understand how yep. you can watch that <laughs> oh <laughs> well, I, I, a lot of people say that i have no problems well to me it's just it's like science okay yeah i had this operation it's yeah. like like it's just he yeah. had the camera while it was being done to him so he was awake and he oh, could see it oh right could see it yeah oh. that might be a bit more disconcerting um but i i still think i'd be able to handle that if it was just like a local anesthetic and they were drilling through my bone i'd probably you know like when you see the drill like it's when like a big needle comes in and you go oh, you know like you start to get the heebie-jeebies when you see they're about to jab you with a needle you know it's yeah yeah, yeah, imagine if they came in with a bone drill. Oh, God. I can't even get my wisdom <laughs> teeth removed. All right, th- thanks All right. a lot for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I like your stuff, and I'm uh, no glad worries. we got to do this. Thank you very much. I, I love your work, too. Where can people catch you? I'll link, we'll link it in down below, of course. Yeah, just youtube.com slash Rossman Group with two S's and two N's. Um, I, I try to upload a few videos every week on repair or business or whatever. A few? It seems like you're doing at least one a day. That's yeah. what it seems like to me, anyway. Well, hopefully, if I say a few, then when they go, if they go <laughs> right, there and they see a lot, then it's like, oh wow, he's doing extra work. But if I said do it two times a day, and it's like, man, this guy, what did he retire? <laughs> I like giving myself the leeway to be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many videos have you got up now? Something like seven or eight hundred. Right. Wow. Yep. Unbelievable. Anyway, if you want to know all about repair and business and you do lots of life philosophy stuff as well yeah I've, I've, chatting I've about screwed all up, that sort of jazz yeah i've screwed up almost everything that you can possibly screw up in business <laughs> at a very young age and my hope is for other people to avoid doing all the stupid things i've done so most of that sure. is like me at 27 yep. yelling at my 17 year old self right and like if i could sit my 17 year old self in front of this and that he would ideally not make all the stupid mistakes i made so virtually yep. everything I talk about is something that I learned from losing money, losing time, or losing sanity, and hoping that I can pass that on to other people. That's terrific. I love it. So, yes, people subscribe to Lewis. And you're on Twitter as well? Yeah. I don't know if you tweet much, do you? Almost never. I'm, Almost never. I, I, I can't get I th- things across in 140 characters. I can barely get things across in 140 <laughs> minutes, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Your videos are quite long form, just like mine. Yeah. Yep. We've got a niche audience in that respect. Oh, yeah. I see a lot of comments on my, and I've seen it sometimes on your stuff, like this could have been a three-minute video, and it's exactly. like, yeah, but yeah, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to do that. Go watch. No, know. exactly. <laughs> and I know bloggers that, yeah, do highly, uh, in our field, that do highly polished five-minute videos, and it takes them 30 hours' work to uh, do a five-minute polished video. I mean, I could like, do like a, I could do a five-minute video. It's just like, 
There, every video that I would watch on YouTube would frustrate me because I would see mm. it's like, okay, but how did he do that? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Well, why is it like it's the same shit? It's like five yeah. X fast forwarded, pirated techno music. Yeah, local. It's like no. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see what he actually did. It's like I don't want to create like the trial to the actual content that you have to pay for. Yep. It's like this is the actual, this is the actual product, and it's like people are asking for the trial. I don't, I no, don't get I, it. And I don't get people who watch a five minute op amp tutorial and then watch my one at forty five minutes long and go, oh, the five minute one was so much better. It's like. Do you know how much information I put in that forty-five minute video? I would want to. I watched <laughs> that like, video. I would want to watch a five-hour one because I'm sure there's more <laughs> that I could learn from it. <laughs> there's tons more. Yeah, it's like you can't learn much in five minutes. It's you know, not 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 technical stuff anyway. As far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't know how to get across how a lot of this stuff works, and I like the, the and even the video that the uh, Fruity Inc had the issue with. That was a ten-minute video, and we we joked. I think yeah. the only reason they even found that is because they went to my channel. They saw, oh my god, this guy talks into a camera for three hours at a time. Fuck this! And they're just like <laughs> scrolling, and they probably scrolled by like shortest duration. And it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. oh my god, he did one video that's like eight or nine minutes. Click schematic is like fifty-eight <laughs> seconds in. Okay, claim. Like I, I think there's a genuine chance that they don't even know that my other stuff has schematics because the, the right. sad, the sad intern at that law firm yeah, that's yeah. dealing with this is like, <laughs> we have to deal with copyright in China and suing Samsung, and you're bitching at me about schematics and some. We know on YouTube. What the fuck? We know. <laughs> they gave it to an intern, and the intern's like, "I'm not watching all this shit." And the, the reason that one video is the one that got shit is because that video is eight or ten minutes. I never do eight or ten yep. minute videos, and yep. I. And the only reason that video is eight minutes is because it was literally a fuse. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no idea. Well, oh, love it. Right, anyway, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks, Lewis. It's all been right. great, mate. Right, you have a good day. Catch you next time. <laughs>